Hello everyone, it's, it's Mr. Morrell here with Ms. Morgan, um, and we're here to take you through a grade five theory paper. Um, and so this time we're just going to sort of show you the paper, talk you through the questions, give you some little bit hints um, on how to do it, um, but there will be a follow-up video where we can answer any questions um, that you might have. Um, so, uh, before we begin, you need to get a piece of paper and we'll send some um, scans of manuscript paper so you can print that out and a sharp pen or well, pencil ideally and a rubber so you, so you should be able to write down all the questions in front of you to work on. Exactly. So, um, and we can also send you this document um, if, if a PDF version of this would be more helpful. Um, so. But yeah, this is what, what the Grade 5 Theory paper, paper looks like. Um, and so it's sort of good to be familiar with it, um, to know how they ask the questions. Um, so this is question number one. So question one, part A. The following extract begins on the first beat of the bar. Put in the missing bar lines. This is worth three marks. So you're probably going to want to consider the time signature here. So try and work out how long each beamed group lasts as well. So try and kind of make things bigger, but them into even bigger blocks each time. So build up from the small to the big. And don't forget that you're always allowed to annotate on top of the scores um, just as long as the answer is presentable you know you can be writing numbers and tallies on top of it um, just to help you but yeah work from left to right don't try and jump in anywhere always just go through really methodically so question b so our new piece of music here so we're looking at this extract, so we'll keep flicking back up towards it. So part one, we're looking at chords. So chords marks A, B and C. So the Roman numerals uh, are relevant to the key we're in. So the, the title of this piece on the right hand of the music gives it away what key we're in. And then try and work out um, what scale degree the root of each chord starts on. So chord A, we're in the third bar. Try and put all the notes together in their shortest form. And then count up from the, the first scale degree. So look at the key signature, look at the name of the piece, put those all together. So there's three there, one in bar three, one in bar five, and one in bar six. There's a little bit of a trap in the second bar. Um, in the left hand. I won't tell you any more, but just watch out for that. That could be yeah, a bit off the thing. Okay, so the next part of the question, part two, name each of the ornaments in the right hand part of bars one and three. Okay, so we're looking for two answers here, bar one and three, naming the ornaments that are in that bar. So in bar one, here, see if you can find the ornaments, and name it. And then bar three, there's a different kind of ornament. If you're not 100% sure of the name, draw the ornament, um, because identifying the ornaments is as much a part of the question here as actually knowing their names. So knowing what, what symbol. The spelling is not quite so important, but yeah. Next, next week. <laughs> and if you need more time, um, you can always pause the video or just look at the digital version and we'll come back to it. Okay. So the last part, question three, give the technical name of the note in the right hand part marked X. So this, we need to count up from B flat. And try to remember there's lots of different names it could be. So we have tonic, dominant, subdominant. If you're not sure, write down what's, what number scale degree it is, so one, two, three, four, five, etc. 
and I may come back to you later. So on to question number two. So part A, describe fully, for example, minor third or perfect fifth, each of these melodic intervals. Okay. So this is the first one. Remember, always look at the clef and the key signature. And don't be afraid to just write that down either, because it's useful when you're going back to check, if you can just see at a glance, you know, what, what key you're in, what the two notes are. Um, and remember, there's a very specific method for working through intervals. Um, and so if you need to write down the steps again, do, and then you can just follow them. But remember, the bottom, the lower of the two notes is always the more significant one for trying to work out intervals. Um, they put most of your attention on that, even if it comes second, like it does here. Hey. So part B, you need to write a, a melodic interval, which is described below. So perfect fourth. So you try and, it might be helpful to try and write it the octave below. First of all, so writing on a, on a low F and writing perfect fourth above, and then writing it with ledger lines. So read the question carefully. And remember what melodic means, it's different to a harmonic interval. Another thing to watch out for, just be careful of, of key signatures and whether you have a key signature, whether that means you need to change anything, use accidentals. That second one is a trap. Yeah, there is. Hmm, it's a mean question. Okay, we'll stroll through all of this white space. Questions here, we'll keep going. So, it's my turn, isn't it? Um, question number three. Look at this extract, which is adapted from a piece for violin and piano by Adam Kass, and then answer the questions that follow. So, just things to watch out for. Look out for your instruments. If you're just reading from left to right, because music's always printed in a very methodical way. Um, so, instruments and clefs, then key signatures, and time signatures, and tempo markings, dynamics and phrase marks. Um, and yeah, if you have a bit of paper to, to spare, you could always just write down. Um, and one way to do that might be to just write each bar number, and then next to that bar number, writing what you find in that bar, um, just to help you get really familiar with this extract. Um, but of course, look at the questions first, so you're not just doing that for the sake of it. So the first question they're asking about this music, mark clearly on the music using the appropriate capital letter for identification, one example of each of the following. And they also want you to give the bar number of each of your answers as shown in the answer to A. So this is an example. You would put the letter A, capital A, um, next to an instruction to get gradually quieter. Um, and so the person who's done this has found it in bar four. Um, and this, so without the PDF, it's worth writing down instead just the bar number and the beat of the bar it occurs on. So in the case of A, it will be on bar four, beat one. Yeah. So if you don't have the PDF, don't worry. Yeah, you don't need to print it out, um, of course. Good. Um, I'll just go through the, the rest of these. I'll just read them out. So B, um, they want you to find, well, in, in bars one to four of the violin part, a supertonic note in the key of D major. Um, and again, if you don't have a PDF, just write down the note concerned exactly where it is. Um, C, in bars one to four of the right hand piano part, so just be careful you're on the right stave there a note that is not in the key of D major. So something you might 
do usefully to answer that one is to write all the notes that are in D major, um, just to help you. And then D in bars five to eight of the piano part, find a note that is an enharmonic equivalent of E flat. So remember what enharmonic equivalent is, um, and then think about that note specifically. Um, so I'll just scroll up the extract one more time, and you can see it's not very long because it's always printed quite big on the page. But yeah, we will talk about that in, in much more detail when we go through it again. So part two, re so rewrite the first right hand piano chord of the extract so it sounds at the same pitch but using the tenor C clef. So remember to put in the clef and key signature. So first you need to remember which line C, middle C is in the tenor clef. So that really so that's where our clef goes and it starts. And remember to transpose the key signature. And then when you're working it out, try writing a treble clef and then working out the intervals from that point and then doing the same thing in the tenor clef. So middle C is a key here. So next question, well it's part of the same question, it's just the next part. Describe the time signature as either simple or compounds and duple, triple or quadruple. Um, so well what, what's the time signature? Um, I'm sure you probably can see that it's 6-8 um, but they want you to go further than that. So they, is 6-8 as a time signature? Is it simple or compounds? And is it or triple or quadruple? So this question is a little bit tricky um, because the answer isn't that intuitive unless you're really, really confident with this kind of thing. So part two, complete the statement. The violin is the highest sounding member of the string family and the lowest sounding member of this family is the... So we're looking for a stringed instrument, which is the lowest sounding of that group. Now for the next part, name a different family of standard orchestral instruments and state its highest sounding member. So a different family of standard orchestral instruments, so anything that's not strings basically, um, and they want you to give a, the highest sounding member of that family. Um, so there's more than one answer here, um, but go with what you're most confident about. Don't try and be extra fancy. There's no, there's no need to do that. But as long as you name a family that's not strings, um, give the right high sounding member and you're fine. And part four, give the meaning of that little racket in the violin part. If you're a string player, you're, you've got an advantage. <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> Have a guess. Okay, so the next one. Now, with these new theory papers, uh, the terms are multiple choice. So it's a little bit easier than it was for, for Miss Morgan and myself. <laughs> that was a very long time ago. So tick one box for each term. And Dante, I mean, this is, this is really sort of, you know, grade three, four. Maybe two. two. And Dante mean? Um, and then what does grazioso mean? So, and Dante could mean quick, at a medium speed, slow, gradually getting quicker. Grazioso means playful or merry, it doesn't mean majestic, graceful or sweet. Lots of options there. Um, it's the sort of thing you either know it or you don't. Part two, true or false? The largest melodic interval in the violin part is a major sixth. So you just need to go through, maybe go back in this video to a time when we pause on the music and look at the biggest intervals next to each other. And again, just make sure you have both the interval and also is it major, minor or perfect? Don't forget that bit because it's worth two marks. And the second bit of this is all the notes in the left hand piano part are in bars five to seven can be found in the scale of E major. So make sure 
you've clocked what the actual key signature of the piece is and try and work out what the difference is between that and D major because there might be an accidental which you also need to take into consideration and is that true or false? Good question. So the next part, this is the final part of this question, it's quite a long question. Which key has the same key signature as D major? Okay, so look back to the extract. What is the key signature of D major? Uh, this is, you, you should know, you should be happy with this question. It's not the most challenging question, I have to say. Um, yeah, so what's the key that has two sharps that isn't D major? Um, and that's the last part of that question. Moving on. Question four, put accidentals in front of the notes that need them to form the scale of D flat. Do not use a key signature. And those are the key words you should always be looking out for. They like to catch you out. I say use or do not. So in this case, we need to remember how many flats are in D flat major. So it's going to be at least B flat, E flat, A flat and D flat but are there more? That's up for you to remember. So use your circle of fits. You should have a copy of the circle of fits, you know, up on your wall somewhere, on your front door, in your kitchen. Um, oh, I work it out again. Yeah. So the next part, write the key signature of four sharps and then one octave ascending of the harmonic minor scale with that key signature. So loads of information there in that question. Um, so if this was me, I would straight away get a highlighter or underline, you know, four sharps. That's the first bit of information you want to be thinking about. And then one octave, that's really important. You don't want to do any more than you have to. Ascending and then a harmonic minor scale. So remember with the minor scale, there are different forms of the minor scale. Um, and I'll tell you now for free, um, there are three kinds of minor, three forms of the minor scale. We've got harmonic, melodic ascending, melodic descending. Um, so that's why they specified ascending. Um, but yeah, and then you've got to sort of reverse engineer the key signature and work out what key, well, what minor key has that key signature. Um, Remember to use semi briefs. Yeah, read the question. Easy yes. marks. You don't want to. You don't want to make silly mistakes that, that cost you, that are easily avoided. Um, and then, I mean, this goes without saying, really, but it's always good to check. Begin on the tonic, and remember to put in any necessary additional accidentals. That's really important because we're talking about minor scale. Okay, major scales use the notes of their key signature. Minor scales, you have to change things. You always have to change things. Um, and depending on what form of the minor scale you're using, depends, you know, what things are going to need to change. So lots of information in that question there, lots of decode, um, and it is worth five marks. So, question five. Now, this was always my least favourite question. So the following melody is written for a horn in F. So transpose it down a perfect fifth, as it will sound at concert pitch, but don't use the key signature and put in all the necessary accidentals. So first things first, we can put, immediately put in our time signature. And so why do for every single note, I'd go down a perfect fifth. So everything needs to change and your accidentals will also need to change. And as we've not got a key signature, we don't need to worry about that getting in the way or anything. So they've told us exactly how to do it. So just take your time. So question number six. Look at this extract and then answer the questions below. So we've got an extract here just for bassoon. Um, but it's worth 15 marks. Um, so again, key things to look out for, all the usual stuff. So give the technical names, for example, tonic or supertonic, of each of the notes marked X and Y. So X is in bar one, Y is in bar two. 
So what are the technical names for these notes? There's X, there's Y. So remember, you need to be thinking about what key we're in. Um, and then of course, you need to remember what all of these technical names are, what order they come in. Is there a note to tell you what key it's in? Always read the question. Key is in is D minor. Okay. Excellent. Next up. So B, rewrite bar one in notes of half the value and remember to include a new time signature. So in this case, we need to work out how many beats are on a bar or smaller values and half everything. So if we had quaver beats beforehand, half a quaver is blank. That's going to be our bottom num number of our time signature and go from there. So everything should be half the value and be smaller. Next up, part C. Rewrite the first note of bar four so that it sounds of the same pitch, but using the alto C clef. Remember to put the clef and the key signature. So alto C clef, you need to remember what that looks like, first of all, so what shape you're trying to draw, and also where exactly you're putting it on the stave. So an earlier question had a tenor C clef, didn't it? So that might be a clue or something. So yeah, the first note of bar four, this is the key bit though, so that it sounds at the same pitch. So what you need to be, you know, really familiar with are, you know, the, the shared pitches. So a note on one clef, where is that same note on a different clef? And D, again, multiple choice. So these are German terms. So Lang's arm, slow, moderately, lively, smoothly. And then mit Aldstruck. So that mit means with, as they all say, and force, bigger, expression, or love. If you're not sure, have a guess. Try and think what makes the most sense as well. So look at the music and try and think which of these looks like it could fit. Don't forget that also with some of these, these terms that are in Italian and German, the words might actually give a clue um, because they might have shared roots in another language, um, for example. Might not be the case here, but it's useful to be aware of. Next question. question. <laughs> laptop was going to die. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, I was worried there. I was, I was worried about you, Miss Morgan. <laughs> okay, so this is where I get to. So next question. Question number seven. Indicate suitable progressions for two cadences in the following melody by writing one, two, four, or five in the boxes underneath the stave and they want you to use one chord per box. Okay, so I haven't done this for quite some time, but what you need to make yourself familiar with is the key that you're in, and then what each of these numerals means in that particular key. So what, because these are talking about chords because they're capital, they're Roman numerals. Okay, so chord one in this key, what's chord two in this key, what's chord four, and what's chord five. And, and then you need yeah. Oops. Helpful tip, it's always a major key. I got Isn't this wrong in my exam a decade ago. Oh. Always a major key. Always a major key. I didn't, yeah. Oh. It's no. so, so you've got the key, you've now written the roots of each of these chords, and then all you need to do is find the notes or write down what the notes are in each of those chords. And these are all talking about triads. So they're three note chords. So what are the three notes in chord one? What are the three notes in chord two? What are the three notes in chord four? What are the three notes in chord five? And then once you've done that, you can look in each bar and see which chords the notes in that bar match up with. So sometimes you might only have the notes from a triad, 
more often than not, you'll have notes that aren't in the triad. So in that case, you need to think about where the strong notes in the bar are. Okay, so that will, you know, sort of be the metrical stresses. First beat of the bar will be probably a chord note. Um, so there's one here, there's another one here, another one here, um, and then again, similar pattern to this bar. So, and there is a, there is a right or a wrong answer for this one. There's not much scope for composing. So, yeah, if you've got it, then you've got it. And that is the end of the paper. <laughs>